It's, uh, it's Advent. We are closing in hard on Christmas. We've got our Advent candles. We've got three of five lit, and the last one is Christmas Eve. So uh, time's ticking. Um, we're getting close to Christmas. And this Advent, if you've been with us, you know we've been sort of um, digging a little deeper into the, uh, the themes that we talk about when we light these Advent candles. When we talk about hope and peace, and now this week, joy, we've been... I want us to take some time to think about those things. We say them, we sing them, right? We sang this morning, we sang joy to the world, the Lord has come. Let earth receive her king. Let every heart prepare him room. Let heaven and nature sing, right? We sing it, joy to the world. But what are we talking about? Joy is a tricky one to nail down, I think. Um, This time of year, there's a lot of talk about joy. You'll see signs that say joy, the joy of the season. If joy is something that just happens at Christmas time, I think we've missed the point. It's a good time to talk about it, but it has to be bigger than that. So what are we talking about when we look at joy? Well, as I've done the last couple of weeks, I think it helps us as we zoom into it to, uh, to, to eliminate what we're not talking about. Because there are some, some things that sort of look joy-ish and that I think we can maybe think of in that place, but is maybe less accurate. First, joy, joy is not merely distraction. Um, it's not. Distraction is, is out there. It's a thing. Um, and there are, there are many, many ways that we um, are bombarded with distraction, that we seek distraction. Some of us are virtually addicted to distraction. Um, Distraction is cheap and easy to produce, right? It's like sugar for our brains. It's just, it's everywhere and it can be addictive, but distraction, even if it's good things, and there's a lot of distraction at Christmas, right? Extra good things on top of the regular things, Christmas specials and Christmas services and Christmas meals and Christmas parties and Christmas shopping and all of these, right? And it's like, okay, that's great. And, and for some of us, we're like, oh, it's too busy. But for some of us, that, that constant, there's always something else coming and it's bright and it's shiny and it's festive. That distraction can be almost a joy substitute. Um, I think when we boil, right down, boil it right down, um, distraction is really just a diversion from things that are painful or uncomfortable or unpleasant in our lives, right? Sometimes that's okay. Like if you're waiting in a long line, but you've got like solitaire on your phone and you pull it out and so you distract yourself while you're in line, hey, that's cool, right? Um, when we try to, to um, keep ourselves distracted so we don't have to face unpleasant or uncomfortable things in the, in the big areas of our life, I think that's, it doesn't change those things or how they impact us. It's a survival strategy, but it doesn't actually, doesn't actually fix anything. And it's certainly not joy. It's really just a delaying tactic. So it's not merely distraction. I'll go a step further though and say when the Bible talks about joy, it is not merely um, the result of happy or pleasant or comfortable circumstances. Those are good things. I'm not, you're like, oh great, the pastor's gonna tell us that we can't have happy and pleasant circumstances, right? Um, No, I'm not saying that at all. Those Those are good things. I mean, anything that we call good generally falls into this category, right? It's snowy. If you've got warm boots that are relatively snow resistant, that's a good thing. That makes walking in the snow, even if you're just walking to your car, more pleasant. That's great. Um, And there is a natural happiness that comes from having comfortable or pleasant circumstances, right? Everyone wants these things. We sort of naturally, I think, um, aspire to these things, right? Reasonably good health, meaningful work, the company of supportive and engaging people, beautiful surroundings. We have that in spades out here, right? And, and uh, enough money to comfortably have one's needs met with a little bit left for some fun and the time in which to enjoy it, right? I mean, if we could have all of those things, and we do in some measures, right? There's a certain happiness that comes from those things. Those are excellent things, and they generally correlate with happiness, but does joy require fortunate circumstances? When the Bible talks about joy, is it something that is just 
you know, uh, reserved for those who, who happen to, to be able to check all of these boxes in life, who get those things. And, and if your circumstances aren't that pleasant or comfortable, or if you've lost some of those things, do you not get joy? The Bible uses the word joy to describe something that is not exactly the same as happiness. I think there's a lot of overlap. It'd be like one of those Venn diagrams, right? The two overlapping circles. Joy and happiness have some overlap, but they're not exactly the same. One key difference, and I got this, I think, from a Bible dictionary I have on my shelf. Um, It mentions that happiness and unhappiness cannot coexist at the same time in the same circumstance, right? You can't be both happy and unhappy with a situation. Sometimes we say, I have mixed feelings about that. Well, that's what you have. It's not really happiness because it's muddied, right? But joy and sorrow can and do coexist. So there's a difference. Uh, A couple of examples from scripture. Um, Isaiah 53.3 says that Jesus was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. That was a description of him. And yet we read in Hebrews 12.2, it says, Yet for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising its shame. He knew what sorrow was. He knew what what, um, it was to endure sorrow uncomfortable circumstances, and that might be the biggest understatement of the year when I'm referring to the cross, crucifixion as, that was uncomfortable circumstances. This is less than ideal, he said. No, like, you know what I mean. So he, he had joy even in the midst of that. And another example, because some of us might think, well, yeah, but that was Jesus. He also walked on water. What about the rest of us? Um, we have a great example. You can read about it in Acts chapter 16 of Paul and Silas couple of Christian um, guys that were going around sharing the gospel. They got locked up for it and they were put in prison. But Acts 16, 23 to 33 describes how they were, they were joyful. They were actually singing. They'd been beaten. They're locked up. They're in the dungeon and it's just not going right. They're singing. I can imagine the jailers and the torture guys in the break room. Like I just, what did we miss with these guys? I don't understand it. Yeah. Like they're singing. Are they just like, is that just it? No, no, they've been going like that for hours. They're, well, have you tried putting them in the stocks, right? Lock their ankles up. They hate that. No, they are. Check. Like, I've done all of that stuff. They're still singing, right? So frustrating when you're, wanting, when you're wanting to make them suffer and they won't stop being joyful. So joy is something that can persist in the face of unpleasant circumstances. So what is it? What is joy? Well, I think we can see a couple of things about it. Joy is an attribute of God himself, This is something that that God experiences uh, certainly on a level and in a way and in a mode that we cannot comprehend. But God experiences perfect joy. Our God is a joyful God. And that might be the biggest thing that you need to take home today. If you've got a picture in your head when you think of God as a grumpy old white guy who's generally scowling, not happy, pretty ticked off, disappointed, kind of doing this a lot, ready to smite, That's not really, I mean, God is certainly righteous and holy. He has wrath against sin, but God is full of joy. If your picture of God isn't smiling, you need to do some work on your picture of God. Um, One of many verses you can look at, Psalm 104, 31, says, May the glory of God endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works. He rejoices. That is like to express joy. Joy is also a fruit of the Spirit, and we've talked about this a couple of times, but this is something that God imparts to believers. We see that in Galatians 5, 22, right? The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy. It's number two on the list after love, and we know love is like the best. So joy is like, that's, this is important. It's something that God has and God gives to us. In search for a good definition... Of joy, I came across one by John Piper, who's way smarter than me, and he defines joy as this. He writes, Christian joy is a good feeling in the soul produced by the Holy Spirit as he causes us to see the beauty of Christ in the world and in the word. I mean, that's, that's a very dense, well-balanced, that's an amazing definition. That's, that's very good. Um, Another one that I came across that's sort of a little bit more concise, joy is an internal characteristic of a life lived in the correct direction. 
It's something that happens inside when a person's life is generally oriented in the right direction, in a Godward direction. So it seems to have more to do with our heading and it has more to do with what God is doing in us and, the, and what he enables us to see than it does with the things that happen around us, which is great, right? Because while we do have agency, we have the ability to make decisions, a whole lot of our circumstances are not things that we have any real control over, right? I mean, we've been talking about the snow. It's pretty, but it's like, it's snow, right? Who likes driving in snow? Most people do not, right? Can't do anything about that. It just sort of happens. Many things in our life are kind of like that. We can get frustrated about them. We can, we can just kind of have resignation towards them, but our circumstances aren't something that we can just totally control. I'm so glad that joy doesn't hang on those. It's something else. So how do we get it? More specifically, how does the birth of Jesus bring us joy? We talk about joy at Christmas. We light that candle that went out. Sorry, that's... that's it is. We'll fix that one. I'm going to light another one here because the symbolism is just not working. If I'm talking about joy and my flame has gone out, it's a little too on the nose, don't you think? So let's light this one. There we go. We talk about joy. The birth of Jesus brings us joy. How? How do we connect those dots? Well, certainly, certainly it brought joy in the past. When we look back to uh, the birth story of Jesus, when he first came in the flesh, we know that there was joy involved. The angel um, who announced his birth to the shepherds said, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Right? The first thing angels say when they show up always is, Don't be afraid. Stop freaking out. And then, what do they say? I have good news of great joy because Jesus is born. So we know his birth is connected to joy. We see in Matthew chapter 2, um, referring to the Magi, the wise men, who were seeking the newborn king. When they saw the star, it says they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. So I think we can understand, all right, in the past, this event that we're looking back to was joyful. I mean, the birth of a new baby is among other things, joyful. But how does it bring us joy in the present? I think it does. But we have to, we have to connect some dots. Because Christmas is a joyful time, for sure. We've talked about that. Um, but when we think back to the birth of Christ, how does it actually bring us joy today, especially beyond the fun of the season? It's one thing to say, the birth of Jesus brings me joy in December. How about the middle of January? Or the second week of February? Does it, how does it reach us there? I think it does, but indirectly. And so, um, let me just grab one of these. It does, but indirectly. At risk of rabbit trailing here a little bit, I just, I think in illustrations, maybe this will, this will help make sense. But, um, we can think about the joy that Christ brings us as the result of a chain of events that actually began way back in eternity past. The Bible tells us before the foundations of the earth were laid. And so Jesus' birth was a milestone on that journey or along that timeline of redemptive history. But it wasn't the first, it wasn't the start of it. It wasn't the final milestone, and at risk of sounding sacrilegious, it was not even the greatest milestone. But it was an important one for, for a very important reason. It marks the point when God's plan first became visible to us. Okay, so imagine if you were on a ship crossing the ocean. Let's say you're sailing to New Zealand, okay? And for some reason out in the middle of the Pacific, the ship suffers some kind of catastrophic failure and it, it sinks and it leaves you and the other passengers floating on lifeboats. There we are, middle of the Pacific. Now, fortunately, before the ship went down, the captain was able to um, radio or get a hold of, you know, to call for help and he, he communicated the ship's location to the authorities on shore and they promised to send a rescue boat to us. So here we are in lifeboats. Now, from our lifeboat, the beginning 
of that ship, that rescue ship's voyage, is invisible to us. We cannot see it. Now, we have some reasons to believe in it. We've been told that the ship was going to set sail, so we could look at our calendar, we could mark the days, whatever we do, and we can believe that the ship is on its way. But looking out at the Pacific would give us nothing for a while, like two or three weeks possibly, depending on how far from land you were. But at some point, the ship becomes visible on the horizon. We might have even lost our bearings out there. We're not even sure exactly which way we should be looking. But if a person was watching for it, they could spot it. It would be just a tiny little speck on the horizon at first, but it was clearly not there a minute ago, and now it's there, right? My eye, is my eyes playing tricks on me? No, I'm pretty sure, right? And sure enough, as you look, that spot gets bigger and bigger, and we can see it. It's still a long way off. I, I did some research. It turns out if you're standing in a lifeboat, the part of the horizon that you can see is about 22 or 23 kilometers away. So I have no idea how that helps you, but that's, a, that's just a free nugget for you. So the boat, I mean, it could still take the boat like an hour to get to you, right? A long hour watching, like, is that boat even coming for it? Like, you know, it's like driving towards the mountains. It's like, they're still there. They're not getting any bigger, but it's on its way. And Jesus' birth is like that moment when the ship becomes visible on the horizon. God's redemptive plan, long promised but invisible, had been steadily advancing. And God's people believed by faith it was coming. But when? When? How long? Right? Is it even coming? Which way should we look? And even his birth was largely missed by those who were waiting for God to rescue them, to redeem his people. And while his birth likely brought great joy to his parents, it's clear that it did not instantly bring widespread joy, right? It just kind of happened quietly, and the process continued. So how does this joy get to all people, right? The angel said, tidings of great joy that will be for all the people. Well, how does, that, how does that happen? We see the process unfold in the Bible, but it's a process, and that's okay. So we can connect some dots. We see that Jesus' followers, they came to see that Jesus was, in fact, the Messiah. He grew up, and he began his ministry as a man, and his followers saw he's the guy. He's the one that we've been waiting for. And among other things, you know, Jesus gave signs that showed that he was who he says he was, but he started predicting his death. And he foretold his death, but he also talked about his resurrection and the joy that it would bring after. Um, John chapter 16, verses 19 to 22 is a great example of this. It reads, Jesus knew that they wanted to ask him. So he said to them, is this what you are asking yourselves? You're asking what I meant by saying, a little while and you will not see me. And again, a little while and you will see me. Truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn into joy. When a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she's delivered the baby, she no longer even remembers her anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. So also you have sorrow now, but I will see you again. And your hearts will rejoice and no one will take your joy from you. So Jesus' resurrection brought joy. Because it was another massive milestone on that, on that redemptive journey. The Messiah had come and, and the resurrection proved that he was who he said he was. And that, that God was actually saving not just little nation of Israel. But he was doing something huge through this person. God's son come in the flesh. And then the story continues and we see that the disciples joy increased when the Holy Spirit came. Acts 13.52 just says it very concisely. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. So Jesus has, has returned to heaven but sent the Holy Spirit. And the joy didn't get less. It got more. It increased. And then we come back to that well-known passage. I referred to it already in Galatians chapter 5. The fruit of the Spirit. And we see that this God-given joy came to be seen as as part of the life of all who believe through the Holy Spirit. You know, it gives us that fruit of the Spirit, love and joy and peace. But not only that, but the fruit, the fruit of the Spirit, that outworking of the Holy Spirit working in us when we put our faith in Christ, 
It leads to a different kind of life. It doesn't just inject feelings. It changes, it changes us, right? It's the difference between like if you have a pine tree in your yard, but you wished you had an apple tree, you can go and staple apples to the tree. I suspect, or you could use twist ties or uh, tape, you know, pick your adhesive method of choice. You could do that. There, look, I've imparted fruit to my pine tree. The Holy Spirit isn't like that. He doesn't throw apples at pine trees. He changes the tree into an apple tree so that it actually produces that kind of fruit. We see in Romans chapter 6, verse 22, it says, but now that you have been set free from sin and have become servants of God, the fruit that you get leads to sanctification and to its end, eternal life. Sanctification, that's a big word. Come on, it's getting close to Christmas. Joy we can handle. Sanctification, that just means the process of becoming holy or being sanctified, changing in your life, the the fabric of your life, the flavor, the character of your life becomes more and more like Jesus. And Paul says this fruit leads to sanctification and to eternal life. So I think we see I, I, I think I'm seeing this correctly. Um, that joy doesn't require a certain set of circumstances, thankfully. Happiness does. Joy does not. Joy is the experience of a certain kind of person. And not like, oh, well, you know, like you were just born that way, or you worked harder, so you're better than. No, it's the kind of person that, that God creates through the work of his Holy Spirit in us. Joy is the experience of a certain kind of person. And that process of sanctification, of growing in holiness, while on the surface of it and probably to our our natural ears, it's like, oh, that sounds awful. That sounds like rigid conformity of wearing like a tie and a suit and acting proper and churchy and saying thee and thou and all. That's not sanctification. Again, if that's the picture in your head, you've got some work to do on your pictures. Um, as, we, as we grow in that, we find that, that we are more joyful. It is, it is a human becoming or living more and more the way that a human was designed to live. So naturally, things kind of work better, right? It's like when you fix the alignment on your truck, if it's been out, it's like, oh, this thing steers so well. What did you do? Did you like... Did you improve it? Did you like put an aftermarket suspension? No, no, I just, I just fixed it so that both, both front tires point in the same direction. It's amazing when you actually have the thing the way it was designed. It's like, oh, this is brilliant. Turn left, go left, right? Um, that's what sanctification does in us, and that's how the joy, that's how we get that joy. So the bad news is it's not instant. It's not like unwrapping a Christmas present. I don't have a new iPhone, (gasps) a new iPhone, instant, I've got it, right? That would be great. Joy, I don't think, is like that. We have moments of that, but the joy that the Bible describes is is a process. But the great thing about processes, they take a while to get there, but then they tend to be unstoppable. And that's the kind of thing that we see. What does this process look like? What does this kind of life look like in our Bible or in our lives? We can see in the Bible um, some aspects of it. It involves things. It involves lots of things. It involves repentance, right? Because we're not perfect. It's a process. So we see in, you know, Psalm 51 verses 8 and 12, it says, let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. This is a prayer of David after he had sinned horribly and he sees that repentance is not just, you know, oh, please don't punish me the way my sins deserve, but repentance will bring some kind of joy. And he prays this with faith. It involves righteousness. Psalm 32, 11 says, be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. The Bible doesn't promise joy to people who live an unrighteous, a a God disobeying life. And it's not just like God's like, well, I'm not going to pay you joy because you didn't, you didn't jump high when I said jump. It's just we're not built to feel joy when we're living at odds with God. It also involves justice. Proverbs 21.15 says, when justice is done, it is a joy to the righteous, but terror to evildoers. It's like, well, yeah, 
The things that bring joy to an upright person are a terror to the people who want to live for themselves. But, but as we grow in sanctification, the right things bring us joy. Romans 4.17 says, The kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. doesn't mean Christians don't eat and drink. In context, he's talking about um, how some people are thinking the kingdom of God is all about obeying the external rules of, of what you should eat and what you should drink and things like that. And Paul's like, it's not, about, it's not about that. It's about righteousness and peace and joy. That's what it's about. And that kind of joy persists even in suffering. That circles us back around to Paul and Silas in the jail, singing when they should have been crying or weeping or cursing God for their horrible luck. We were serving you. We were doing exactly what you said. And this is how you repay us? Why does God hate me? Where is God when I hurt? And they're like, they're singing joy to the world in the prison. How does that work? Because joy persists even in suffering. Psalm 30 verse 5 says his... Anger is but for a moment, and his favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes in the morning. That same Paul who was singing in the prison writes in 2 Corinthians, he says, "Um, I am acting with great boldness towards you. I have great pride in you. I am filled with comfort. In all our affliction, I am overflowing with joy. He's not schizophrenic. He's figured it out. Yes, I'm afflicted, but but I have joy in that, that my circumstances can't take away from me. And this joy that we can have, and it grows in us, it points towards a greater joy in the future. Um, James chapter one, verses two and three, not my favorite passage. I'll just let you know this right off the bat, but it's in here. It says, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. Cheerful, right? He says, but For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. It's a forward-looking thing. Yeah, our circumstances might be rotten, but we can actually take joy in that because we see that this is a process that's leading somewhere. Romans 15, uh, verse 13 says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. May the Holy Spirit fill you, fill you with all joy so that you can have hope that looks forward. Because ultimately, we are looking forward to untainted joy in God's presence. I've been reading a book about heaven. I'm not going to follow this rabbit trail because it could be a whole other sermon. I'm done. But I don't think we think and talk enough about the joy that is set before us. This is not escapism. This is the promises of Scripture. We get joy here, but it's peanuts compared to the joy that we will have in eternity. Trudy Lowen knows this, right, in ways that we don't. We have something to look forward to. Psalm 1611 says, you make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. So Jesus' birth made it possible for us to step into lives of joy now and into eternal lives of perfect joy in eternity. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, we do thank you for the joy that we can have in you. We thank you for the hope of joy we can have in you for the times when we're not feeling that joy. And we thank you that the joy you promise is not contingent on our circumstances. Because those things go up and down and are... They can, yeah, they just change so much and they can't, we can't guarantee those things and you don't promise us those things. You promise us something bigger. Lord, I pray that you would help each and every person here to to turn even by a couple of degrees that their life is more pointed in the right direction, that we are people whose, whose hearts are more and more growing in sanctification. Not that we would be better rule followers, but that we would be the kind of people who experience that enduring joy that you promise us because of the birth of your son. In Jesus' name, amen.